and get started. Uh, I hope everyone is doing well. I know these are uh, kind of crazy times right now, uh, but uh, man, what a blessing this is to be able to still have class. Um, you know, it wasn't that many years ago that this something like this wouldn't have been possible. So uh, it's great to be able to, to still communicate with each other and study the Bible together. And so usually my classes are uh, a lot of interaction, um, and uh, hopefully we can still do that. Um, maybe a little different than normal, but uh, but uh, we'll, we'll give it a go. Uh, so we have been studying uh, the book of Mark in our Wednesday evening class uh, at our church. Um, and uh, so we are up to chapter 5 now. But before we get to chapter 5, um, the chapter four ended uh, with Jesus calming the storm. And uh, so they're on the Sea of Galilee. A uh, storm arises. Jesus is asleep on the boat. And the disciples come to him and say, uh, look, uh, we're going to die. Can, can you wake up and do something? And uh, Jesus uh, wakes up, calms the storm, peace be still, and, and it ends. And, uh, and that got me thinking that, you know, we are kind of in, uh, well, we're not in a literal storm. We, this is kind of a uh, uncertain times for some. Some uh, maybe are not real concerned. Uh, others are, are very concerned about the situation that we're in uh, with the uncertainty uh, of things. And, uh, um, you know, even uh, I think of uh, kind of the, the professionals, the, the people, the experts in uh, uh, what's going on right now seem to, to be saying, hey, there, there's something to be concerned about. Um, and, uh, and so I think, you know, even with Jesus uh, being out on the sea with his apostles, some of them being fishermen, they've been on, on the sea a lot, had probably experienced a lot of storms, uh, and even they were scared. So it was, uh, there was reason for them to be concerned when they were on the sea. Uh, but I also think about another story in the Bible where there was uh, a storm at sea, and that's uh, in Acts 27. Uh, Paul is on a ship uh, being uh, taken to Rome, and they find themselves in, in a storm and all fearful for their lives. And um, but Paul says, look, we're, um, we're going to be okay. I am supposed to make it to Rome. We're going to make it. Uh, but he says, uh, in order for all of us to survive, for any of us to survive, everybody has to stay on the ship. And uh, and so certainly these are uncertain times, kind of scary times. Uh, but the encouragement, I think, for all of us is uh, hey, God is still in control. He's the master of all things. Uh, so don't fear, um, but be wise, uh, you know. Maybe it's safe to, to go out and be in public with a bunch of people, but professionals are saying uh, not so much. Uh, so uh, stay in the boat. Uh, and that's not to say uh, you can't leave your house ever, um, but, uh, but let's be smart about things. Uh, and then uh, Paul also in that situation tells the, them to, to eat, to, to keep up their strength, to take care of themselves. So that'd be my encouragement for you at this time as well. Um, so again, uh, we find them on uh, the Sea of Galilee. They're in this storm, and that takes us to the beginning of chapter 5. Uh, so I'm going to read uh, the first 20 verses of Mark chapter 5, uh, make some comments, and uh, we can open it up for discussion as well. All right. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained by hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. 
Those tending to the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. All right. Um, so a few things here as we start off. So again, they were on uh, the Sea of Galilee. Uh, they um, had been on the, the western shore of the sea, and now they find themselves on the east. This would have been uh, Gentile territory. Now, it's uh, uncertain. Did Jesus and his disciples mean to go here? Was it uh, the storm? They, this was kind of the, the first safest place they could find to land. Um, not real clear here. Um, uh, and it's clear from the story they don't spend a lot of time here. Uh, they're going to go back over to the other side of the sea uh, just as quickly as, as they arrive. Uh, but it says, uh, at least in my translation, that they, they came to the region of the Gerasenes. Some of you, some of your translations um, or at least, and some of the other Gospels uh, might say uh, the region of the, the Gadarenes or the, the uh, Gergesenes. And it seems like, okay, where is it? We're talking about, it seems like we're talking about three different places. Well, my understanding is... Uh, Okay, there's two cities, Gadara and Garasa, and then there is uh, a country, uh, Gergesa. And, and so um, some say kind of they landed in this country. Some say they, uh, they, they speak of the specific cities. Now, these cities weren't actually right on uh, the coast, so there's some question. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, all right. Anyway, um, I, I kind of think of it as uh, I often tell people that I'm from Canton, Ohio, but I've never lived in Canton, Ohio. I lived in Massillon, Ohio. But for people to understand exactly the, the region that I'm from, I say I'm from Canton. Uh, and so I think uh, writers are using different uh, areas that maybe their audience would be more familiar with. And uh, so that's where we get the difference here. And so Jesus uh, encounters this man um, among the two. Yep. You're breaking up. I haven't figured out if it's us or if it's you. I think it might be me. Like, I can understand you, but it's you sound like a robot. pretty choppy like a robot. Okay. About like some of the videos we watched in class. <laughs> yeah. Is anybody else hearing choppy? You're at the unmute. Pam's not here. Her head, yes. Do you have a bunch of people on your Wi Fi? Jason. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, the boys are watching TV. <laughs> it's possible. But he sounds better now. Now that he's interrupted, he's not so choppy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Mom, that's my tablet. <laughs> <laughs> <Did you catch? laughs> Somebody lost their tablet. Somebody's on Wi-Fi. Is it better now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, anyone? No? Better? Oh. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah, it's like that. Understandable, but kind of difficult. Okay. I don't know how long we'll have to do this, um, but hopefully we'll get the kinks worked out by next week. Sounds normal now. Sounds good? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So uh, I guess quick question. What do you notice about this guy? What's that? Anybody can comment. Or nobody can about the him. crazy guy. Is that what yeah, we're the, about? Yeah, the guy coming from the tombs. Demon possessed. So we see this demon possessed guy. What, what's it mean to be demon possessed? So there's there's kind of a debate um, as to okay, what are demons? So that I think it's a good question to to ask. What are demons? And, and some would say, okay, demons are. Um, Satan's angels. 
Others believe that demons are actually uh, the spirits of people who have died. And um, which I guess in this story could make some sense uh, because, um, you know, he says his name is Legion. Uh, a legion would have been a military group of uh, usually around 6,000. Uh, in this situation, there's at least 2,000 uh, evil spirits because there's 2,000 pigs that rush off to the, the sea. The sea. Um, and being that he is uh, around the tombs, uh, if we are to believe that demons are um, the, the spirits of those who are deceased, that would, there certainly would be a lot uh, in that area. Um, but whether they're uh, Satan's angels or spirits of, of evil dead, uh, we don't know exactly. Um, but uh, this man is obviously being tortured by them. Um, and, uh, you know, his life is just uh, completely different because of this uh, demon possession. Um, I guess I kind of hinted at this already, but do you think this encounter with this man was a uh, coincidence? Like, oh, they just happened to show up there and this man rushes towards him. Uh, it was not coincidence. Okay. I have a 50 50 chance, guys. 50 /50. What's that? I mean, he was known to live there. So Jesus at least knew he would encounter him. Yeah, yeah. Whether or not he plans yep. the meeting or not, I'm not sure, but he did probably know he would encounter him. Yeah. Nine zero nine. I'm trying to find this. Hi, Jessica. Hey, Sharon. How you doing? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I agree. It was not a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I don't know that there's ever a coincidence with Jesus. Right, right, yeah. You know, it's it's interesting that you know most of Jesus' ministry, um, with a few exceptions here and there, uh, is to uh, a Jewish audience. But we have this uh, interesting story where the the storm seems to have pushed them uh, off into Gentile territory, and uh, Jesus has this uh, encounter with this man. What, um, thinking about this man's life, what has he lost by being possessed by a demon? It's my fault. Hold on. Family, relationships. I was trying to be helpful. Okay. Family, relationships, yeah. What was the question again? What has this man lost by being possessed by demons? Don, you can pipe in too. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Don. We're eating supper while we're listening to you. Something so. good? A uh, homemade mac and cheese. All right. Looks like it. Are you going to introduce us, <laughs> Jason? This is uh, Sharon and Don from Lancaster. Okay. Uh, uh, Hi, Sharon. We heard all Don. about you on our trip, Don. <laughs> 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 Sharon does a lot about Don. <laughs> We want you to come up and lead our singing. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Hi. Um, he lost his family. Okay, so this man's lost family. He's lost relationships. He's, lost his job. he's clearly lost his mind, his, his way of uh, earning money. Uh, I was going to say his house. Yeah, his house, uh, living among the tombs. Oh, dignity. He's lost his health, you know, he's, he's beating himself and cutting himself uh, daily. Okay. Lost hope. Yeah, lost, yeah, certainly. And so what's he gained from this encounter with Jesus? Everything. <laughs> yeah. He's free. He's finally free. Can you imagine, uh, I know we can't imagine. I can't imagine even being possessed by one demon, but this is thousands of demons in this one man. And in an instant, uh, it's all gone. Right. And it, doesn't it say later that he, um, you know, like he goes back into the town and, and then later 
uh, when Jesus and the disciples like go back over there, like there's all these converts, right? That that believe in Jesus because of this man. Basically, the first missionary, because he tells them to go back. Yeah. So uh, you know, I'd Mark uh, earlier in Mark, and I think we're going to see that it here in a minute that um, whenever Jesus is talking in in Jewish uh, territory, he tells them not to go and talk to other people right. about him. But here right. we see in this situation, he says, you know, go to your family and friends and tell them what has happened to you. Yeah. Uh, and so there, there's something, clearly something different here. Because he wanted to go with them, right? He wanted to get in the boat and go with them, right? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think um, this is true or ought to be true for any of us. You know, certainly uh, when we came to Jesus, it wasn't like we had thousands of demons in us that have been cast out. But uh hopefully if we have a relationship with Jesus, our lives have been transformed. And uh, so there ought to be this desire, uh, as we see in this man, his, his life's been changed. And so wh what's his first reaction? Uh, go anywhere Jesus goes. Say that again, Jason. What's his first reaction? Yeah, the man's first reaction, what, what's he want to do? He, he wants oh, okay. to go with Jesus. Right, okay. I didn't understand. Sorry. No, you're fine. Why do you suppose? So we see the 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 Jesus cast these uh, demons into these pigs. They run off into the sea and, and are drowned. Uh, why do you suppose uh, the people of the city want Jesus to leave? <laughs> Obviously, the owner of the pigs is pretty upset. His source of income is gone. I think they're just, um, to me, it's like that encounter when um, Peter gets out of the boat after um, they'd been fishing all night, and then they go catch all the fish, and he gets out and he says, go away from me, for I'm a simple man. Uh -huh. You know, I think they're just like, don't know what to do with this person, and it's scary, maybe, you know? Yeah. Like yeah. what? What is this man? What is he doing? Right. Okay. So Tina says two thousand pigs. Uh, that's their the 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 whole livestock. The, their income. So certainly uh, anybody that benefited from uh, those pigs uh, would not be happy here. And uh, you know, I think we see uh, you know in the book of Acts uh, when. Paul is on his missionary journey um, and some people are being converted uh, and a little girl has demons cast out of her and she can right. no longer, uh, right. kind of prophesy about things. Uh, people are mad. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, yeah, their lives have been kind of messed up a little bit. Yeah. What do you think, um, can, may I ask you a question? <laughs> <laughs> Only if I know the answer. <laughs> oh, okay. What, why do you think they asked to go into the pigs? Because the pigs died. Sure. So if the pigs are destroyed, what happens to the demons? Like it, it, he asked, they asked not to go into the abyss, right? Into the abyss, but right. But if the yeah. pigs died, then where do the demons go? Yeah. Disney, Disneyland. Don said Disneyland. <laughs> Disney. <laughs> they uh they got a a free cruise, I guess. Like like you know, I, that that has always that, confused me because I'm like they end up dying anyway. So they probably didn't do they not go into the abyss when they die, or do they go into somebody else? Like that's what I thought. Maybe if they if they died in whatever host they were in, they got to go and you know, what do you call it? Not indwell. Inhabit? Possess. Yeah. Possess, possess somebody else. Maybe they were like released. I don't know. Yeah. Sure. Well, you know, that, that word abyss is like um, kind of a bottomless pit. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it seems like, um, you know, if these are, uh, and some believe, uh, like I said already, uh, uh, for example, um, oh, I had a book here. 
Um, Joe Beam wrote a book, Seeing the Unseen. Uh-huh. About, uh, angels and demons and uh, Satan. And, and he believes that uh, demons are the spirits of those who have, have died, these spirits that are still kind of lingering on. So uh, these uh, spirits may be saying, hey, don't, don't send us off into the eternal, uh, eternal hell, into this abyss, but allow us to, to continue uh, on in, a, in another host. Mm, okay. Now, okay. did they know that the pigs would rush off into the, <laughs> into the sea and drown? You know, I don't, I don't know what the, the thought process there was. But. Right, right. Hi, Jace. But as I've said before, uh, in this story, we see that uh, uh, Jesus invented deviled ham. Deviled ham. Oh, yeah, I yeah. get it. I get yeah. it. Yeah. The <laughs> Yeah, my wife didn't like that joke. <laughs> so uh, we already mentioned that. Um, Jesus invented deviled ham. So why... Why do you suppose Jesus encourages this man to go share what has happened to him as opposed to uh, others uh, that he encounters? God. Why do you think he told him to go share what happened to him versus when he healed other people, he would say, don't, don't say anything? I think some of it could be timing. We're farther along in his ministry at this point. And okay. Before he was trying, I mean, he's already drawing crowds now. At first, he was maybe trying to avoid crowds a little bit Okay. to be able to accomplish more maybe. And I I don't know if he, you know, after this point, if he does that anymore where he tells people to be quiet or not. Okay. Well, actually, we're going to see at the, the end of this chapter that uh, – when he raises the Jairus' daughter, he says, uh, uh, "It says he gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this." So uh, he's like, he's still at the point where he's telling some people not not to share. Um, okay. I think the I think the difference is um, where these are. This is a Gentile region. Uh, maybe their understanding they have little or no understanding of the Messiah, who the Messiah is, where the Jews at this point have a, a false impression of what the Messiah was meant to be. And so Jesus, when he's uh, speaking to a, a Jewish audience, um, doesn't want them spreading false information about what his mission is all about. Right. Yeah. And I thought maybe, too, that was far enough away just – um location wise from the center of where his persecution was going to come from sure. it didn't really matter yeah. so much if that escalated right there that wasn't like his home base and um it wouldn't have shortened his ministry you know because i feel like from the time that he really started his public ministry in the, the in the jewish area i mean it escalated so fast with the persecution i feel like that's why he had to put it off a little bit you know, um, tell people to be quiet for a while because it just got started, go you know, so fast. Right. You know, yeah. It would have led to his death that much faster. You know, like people right. talking about it all the time. Whereas this is far enough away. Sure. It may not have mattered as much. Yeah. And who else would have told him? Right. Like, there's nobody else over there to tell him, right? I mean, he's right. not staying there. <laughs> So um, he's he's relying on him to go share with those people. Right. Well, what a witness that would have been, right? Yeah. For all the people all that, knew. that knew about him and the things that, that had happened to him and how crazy he was and how he's completely normal. Mm -hmm. uh, it says he's in his right mind. Uh, that, yeah. uh, that would have been quite a story. To, to have heard. Yeah. Whoops. Uh oh, what happened? Oh. Any other <laughs> thoughts, questions about uh, this encounter with this de demon possessed man? All right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Sound like he said, all right. All right. All right. Jace has joined us now. Yeah, I saw that. Hi, Jace. 
Hi. <laughs> Hi. He's like, who is that? I don't know. All right. Well, let's uh, move on to the next story unless uh, somebody else has something else to, to add or question. Are you in Are you in Mark? Because we, we didn't come in right at the beginning. Are you in yes. Mark? I'm sorry. Mark chapter five. Yes. Okay. All right. So we're going to pick up in verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came and when he saw Jesus fell at his feet, he pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding around you, his disciple answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who... Who had done it? Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, J James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, there were complete, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. All right. Um, so we see uh, an encounter with two different people here and uh, two very uh, different people here. And uh, two diff people very different from uh, the man that Jesus has just encountered. So we see Jesus uh, minister to a man who was uh, a Gentile, and now he's back into to Jewish territory. Um, and uh, here we see a, a very special, uh, prominent uh, Jewish man who is a synagogue leader. Um, what are some differences that we could see between um, Jairus and uh, this woman? She was cast out of the temple because of her bleeding and she's poor. Okay. And he's the synagogue ruler, so he's got the prominent place. He's like the man in the synagogue who probably didn't even like Jesus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know. It seems so, like. Go ahead. No, I was going to another another point so you can follow up on hers <laughs> um, so yeah um, here we have this uh, woman who because of her bleeding um, you, you can look back in uh, Leviticus um, let's see I don't know the exact um, yeah mine doesn't give it either Leviticus 15 I believe is what this said uh, give some laws about uh, women um, in their their menstrual cycles and uh, their the uncleanness uh, associated yeah. there um, and this particular woman has been going through this uh, for 12 years so for 12 straight years this woman has been uh, considered uh, unclean uh, by society and uh, and so she likely has not had a lot of contact with with much of anybody and uh, so for her to even show up in this uh, crowd uh, 
took a lot of faith uh, on her part. Uh, but here we see a man who is uh, who works in the synagogue and, and a woman who is not e allowed anywhere near a synagogue. Mm -hmm. um, and Jerry mentioned a, a good point that uh, him being a leader in the synagogue, um, he may not have cared much for for Jesus and for who he he said he who he claimed to be. He's desperate that his daughter's um, But yeah, his, he's desperate, and uh, we see again great faith. So so we do see some similarities between these two, but but also some some major differences. I think also his his name is mentioned. Um, you know, if uh, Mark mentions his name in here, um, his audience may know, hey, uh, you know, I've heard that name. I've heard of this guy before. Um, but even if he were to mention this woman's name, who maybe she never even gave her name, uh, nobody would have known her. So we have uh, two very different people. Somebody, one person probably well respected, somebody else uh, kind of seen as, as an outsider because of her condition. One person that was uh, probably fairly wealthy, another person who had given up all of their income to, to be well and is still not well. So uh, a lot of difference here. John, what were you going to say? Um, it's interesting to me that, you know, the woman reaches out because of her faith and just believing that if she touches him, but then like Jairus is almost kind of coached into do not fear only believe, or I mean, he's talking to the ruler of the synagogue, but he's like, I don't know. It seems like he's coaching them in that you need to believe at the same time. Yeah. Um, I don't know if he's, he's not necessarily directly coaching the man or the ruler that was there, I guess. Sure. Um, well, I think, you know, you have, uh, in one situation, uh, he has faith that, that Jesus can heal his daughter who is sick, but when it comes to, well, well now she is dead, um, will he have the faith to believe that, yeah, well, that's, Jesus can still do something here. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, and I have the, I think about like, okay, so she, she, the lady was, she was reaching out and touching him. Um, whereas, you know, and she just hoped that, uh, just that little bit of touch would, would heal her. Whereas he, the guy wanted him to come to his house and lay his hands on her to have her be healed. And I think about the, the, it was a Roman centurion, right. That said, um, wanted his kid to be healed and he was like you just say the word jesus and i know right. that he'll right. be healed um, right. so i don't know if it shows differences in their faith or um what they expected jesus to do for sure. them um i don't know yeah kind of like uh, well maybe this man ha having a prominent place in society uh is used to saying hey uh do this for me and, and gets what he wants um, and so, hey, Jesus, come to my house and kind of expects him, him to follow suit. Uh, and this woman just kind of tries to be secretive about even what she's doing. Um, well, this guy's daughter is dying. So if he's run to Jesus and they're trying to get him to come back to the house and he just stops because somebody's touched him, I can't, I don't know. Like, you know, she's on her deathbed because she dies on their way back to the house. So he's in a hurry and Jesus stops to talk to this woman. I don't know. I just think there's there's a lot going on sure. in this. But it also teaches him how much Jesus loves everybody, no matter yeah. what, you know. Well, and it, says, it says he fell at his feet and pleaded with him. I'm, I've got the NLT, and it says um, fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. I mean, that's, uh-oh, what happened? He's not with her when she dies. You know, if you think you're right, going to right. die, you're going to be with them. But he's, this is a last resort for him. Yeah. Yeah. But both of them have very drastically different situations, but um, their stories in the fact that they, they go to great length to get Jesus, to, to get near Jesus, to get healing um, <laughs> is very similar. You know, they're, they're both very desperate and in need of help, but they both show uh, a lot of faith and encountering Jesus and asking or even just reaching out for, for his help. Uh, you know, obviously, because you have this woman who says she spent years spending money on doctors, thinking she was going to the right people to get help. And, uh, you know, she, she happens to hear this story of Jesus and, uh, 
and she's desperate. So she does whatever she can and believes that, that, Hey, this, this is going to, to work. You know, um, could Jesus have just kind of kept moving, you know, yes, he, he realizes he just healed somebody. Well, well he could have just kept moving and, and gone on. So uh, wh why stop and take special attention of this woman? It's, just, it's one more example of where he purposely acknowledges women and their value in, in society, but also in their in the spiritual context. Absolutely, and yeah. In all people, regardless of gender, are going to have value in the kingdom. Yeah, yeah. It's a female outcast. Yeah, that's a very good point that even if this woman didn't have this, uh, this bleeding issue, um, people around her probably didn't think real highly of the fact that she's crowding around Jesus. Um, you know, that, that in a, the, their society, um, uh, some would, uh, you know, some would pray that, uh, thank God that I wasn't, uh, born a Gentile or born a woman. Um, and, uh, and Jesus really turns that perception uh, upside down and treats uh, all people with, with love and with dignity and shows special attention. So, uh, yeah, that's a, a very good point. I think it's, you know, funny being uh, the apostles, the, the Jesus has all these people bumping into him and touching him and, there, he says, you know, who touched me? <laughs> and obviously there, it seems like an obvious reaction. Well, Jesus, uh, everybody's <laughs> touching you. <laughs> yeah. What but, are you talking about? Yeah. Uh, so what do we learn about Jesus from these encounters? The, the whole chapter, what do we learn about Jesus? I think he's very intentional about the lessons he's teaching through every healing he does. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. He's digital not... about how he meets people and interacts them, interacts with them, and um, you know, with Jairus, he's intentional to not heal him how he wants, but how he can instead. Um, yeah. Sorry, I didn't know. Mine was muted again. Um, I just said he was, Jesus is always able to be interrupted, like whatever God's plan is for him for the day. Like, it's not like, okay, I've got this agenda and I got to go do this. And I mean, he, he was accessible. Right, right. Yeah, he was uh, available to, to people, accessible to people. Um, while he he had maybe he had a place he wanted to go things he planned to do he was uh always willing to take a detour mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. you know and and rather than saying well i can heal your daughter from a distance you know i can just say the word and she'll be healed uh he's willing to go to the house um right uh, it shows uh it just shows great care for the people that he's talking to it's not just a you're just one other person I'm healing. That's it seems to be special attention to everybody. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. if he's surrounded by a crowd of people and probably a lot of people that need to be healed, you know, he could have just reached out his hands and said, all of you are, are healed or whatever you're going through. But it, you know, he takes special attention towards people. Yeah. And I think that's interesting too, because, you know, we think if Jesus was here today, like in the midst of what's going on right now, he would just say, okay, coronavirus be gone. Yeah. But he, did, he didn't even do that back then. I mean, he was very um, selective and purposeful. Uh, you know, he went from town to town. And I think, I think it's because his mission was not about physical healing. It was right. about spiritual healing. Right. And so, you know, sometimes that's hard for us to understand because we think, well, why didn't he just you know, take care of everybody, but, sure. um, that's where we're physical and yeah. 
Yeah. But, yeah, that's a very good point that uh, consider what his overall mission was. And as Aaron pointed out, uh, the, the point, the, the reason this is included in this story is probably not so much that Jesus is able to heal the woman by her touching his cloak, but that the fact that he took the time to address this woman and uh, uh, sh treated her with, with dignity um, mm -hmm. shows more, not his, his power, but how he uh, interacted with people and his love and compassion for others. Right. And he wasn't like the Pharisees who would have been like, you touched me. Now right. you have made me unclean right. because you touched me. You're not even supposed to be out here. Right. You know, what are you doing out here? You know, whatever. Um, right. He really cared about people. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and we see, uh, you know, I think by, uh, you know, we're going to see later on, uh, well, particularly in Galatians, where it talks about uh, all, all being one in Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female. And mm -hmm. we see this in this interaction. We have this, uh, this Gentile that, that Jesus heals and interacts with. We have uh, this Jewish leader, this male Jewish leader. Uh, that he interacts with, but we also have this this woman, uh, and so Jesus is is available to to all people. Yeah. And uh, do you think Jairus was cast out of the synagogue after this? I bet he was. <laughs> it's possible. He turned against. I mean, what everybody was, you know, they were trying to kill Jesus, and here he's running to him to help him. Right. I would think he yeah. lost his job. He lost everything. What after him? But he was saving his kid. He do anything to yeah. save his kid. But, you know, it yeah. seems, uh, you know, Mark is actually, he writes to a Gentile audience, but, but it seems like by including his name, Jairus' name, uh, he's, he's including that because his audience would know, know that, that name. They know who that is. Now, do they know who that is because he was um, prominent among the Christians at that time when he's writing this? Do they know it because uh, of the history of, uh, leaders uh, in, in Jewish synagogues. Um, I would probably lean toward the first that they know him because he, he is a, a Christian and among their group. Um, but he's, he's known. Uh, so uh, whether, you know, do, does he, he give his life to following Jesus? If so, yeah, probably not uh, a leader in the synagogue anymore. Is he the only one that tells this Mark? It's, um, it's in Luke too, Don said. Yeah, uh, it's in, in Matthew and Luke. Okay. How ironic would it be that though, does make sense. people in the synagogue that cast out the lady touched him on the way? You know mm. what I mean? Like mm. he, he could have been part of that too. It doesn't say that at all, but that would have been. Right. Um, Sean? It makes sense that you were saying on the you know, demon possessed man that Jesus tells him, go tell everybody. But then on Jairus, he says, not to tell anybody to keep it quiet. But that makes sense to me now yeah. because you've got this man who's going to be persecuted heavily for it right at the start. Yeah. He's got other work he needs him to be doing. So yeah, yeah. keep it quiet and move on. Yeah. So uh, I guess we, we often think of uh, about uh, what are Jesus motives for, for saying, don't talk to anybody. But could it be that he's trying to spare them from mm -hmm. persecution at this time? That's yeah. that's a very yeah. good point. Yeah. Well, it didn't work, did it? Yeah. <laughs> everybody went around telling everybody what the heck Jesus did. Sure. Yeah, that's one way. Not one way to not keep a secret is to tell people not to tell anybody. Right. Go tell them. Right. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, it, it's very clear that when Jesus uh, interacts with people and changes their lives in different ways, uh, it doesn't matter if they're told to be quiet or told to speak, <laughs> they're, they're going to speak. Right, yeah. right. Uh, yeah. Do we realize today how much of a difference Jesus has made in our lives to, to speak up when there's a chance to speak up? <laughs> so kind of... Uh, Last question and, and wrapping up. Um, if you're kind of putting yourself in, in this story, um, and I know maybe we, we have a hard time relating to, to some of these characters, but uh, 
uh, what do we learn about ourselves or what do you learn about you from this, these encounters? Mm -hmm. My comments over here too. <laughs> hmm. Like you mean, which one do we relate to, or? Well, I mean, you could do that, or you could just say, okay, based on Jesus' interaction with these people, um, what's that say about us for today? Oh, okay. Well, obviously, he values the outcast, the the people that society would. Just, you know, women, the demon possessed man. So, but nobody is beyond the reaches of his love and his grace. And so we shouldn't, if he didn't, if he didn't ignore them, we shouldn't ignore them. Sure. Yeah. Shouldn't be afraid to ask for what you need. Okay. That's, oh, that's yeah. good. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, we have uh, a couple of people here. Really, all, you know, the, the first man doesn't necessarily, isn't really capable of asking directly for, for help. But uh, these other two certainly, yeah, they could have found themselves in a position where they're uncomfortable asking for help. You know, the the synagogue leader, or what if somebody sees me, or what if with Jesus, or the, the woman who have, uh, society is outcast. Um, even, yeah, there'd be fear of even being in public around. It. So, um, do we are we comfortable enough to ask when we need help? And sometimes that's a pride thing. Sure. And certainly, uh, you know, I would think uh, Jairus had to overcome some pride here yeah. to to come and ask Jesus for help. Yeah. Yeah. I think we see, at least for me, it sticks out with, especially with the gyro story, that um, God's not always going to work in the ways that we expect him to. And, okay. You know, we may think, well, this is a terrible situation right now because our churches can't meet. And, you know, there's all kinds of negatives we could think of. But then you can also think that we're kind of being forced into rethinking how we do things or being able to do things a different way. And maybe that's, um, you know, there's lots of good things. It's going sure. to force us to meet our neighbors or to spend time with the elderly that need help and things like that, or the sick, like it kind of forces us into those situations. Um, so I can see the good in it too. So just that he's going to, yeah, he works in mysterious ways and yeah. we may think that it's not good from our perspective initially, but he'll always work it out for good. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Terry and I were talking today. We were out walking about, um, she had gotten a call from a lady at the church that was saying she was going out and getting some uh, groceries for some people that needed from the church and, you know, asked Terry if there was anything they needed or anything like that and that she was going to take a meal to somebody or something. And, and uh, she was just commenting, you know, what do we, what's one of the things that we need to learn from this whole, you know, coronavirus situation that, um, reaching out to people, you know, and um, when, when you're not able to reach out, um, then, but when you can reach out, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah I told somebody like, the other day, like, we can't get together as a church, but we can still be the church to so many different people mm -hmm. this way. You know, there's, we've got to brainstorm and figure out better ways to serve people that maybe we haven't thought of before. Yeah. Can use our spiritual gifts. That's right. Yeah, Pam. yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, we we uh, don't have necessarily the the cleanliness laws that the the Jews had, uh, but we certainly uh, have groups in society maybe that we would uh, not not vocally, but we label unclean, and mm -hmm. uh, and certainly Jesus uh, was not limited by that mentality. Mm -hmm. That uh, 
Jesus was accessible to all people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, any other thoughts, questions? Anything? Nope. Nope. Don says nope. All right. Shout nope. out to Eric. Great house. I just Eric, saw you. <laughs> hey, Eric. I haven't seen you in a long time. <laughs> didn't know it was that, Tina. Yeah, we didn't realize that <laughs> until you just turned the video on. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, don't you live in Ohio now? That's not the right color shirt to be wearing. <laughs> he's got a result. You guys are muted. He's talking I'm to Matt and I can't even hear him. <laughs> oh, he's screen. got, he did like I You're did. You're muted. Got it muted. Oh, that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. right, bring in the kid. Oh, there he is. There he is. Now I can talk. <laughs> <laughs> I had to step out a minute. The baby needed a bath. <laughs> <laughs> Good to <Baby>. see you. <laughs> All right. Well, um, we will try this again next week, and uh, uh, we'll hopefully have hopefully all of you can get on again <laughs> next week. Maybe have a few more. Um, but I uh, hope everybody has a good week and uh, stay safe and healthy. Yeah. Glad you're all home together again. Yeah. I know. It's so nice. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there's Deborah. Hi, Deborah. <laughs> and my friend Shelly's on and Dave and Jennifer. Hey, Jerry. Oh. Yes, I'm cool. I talked to Shirley. Drew's on today. too. He doesn't have his video on. Hi, Drew. <laughs> <laughs>